Well, church, I'm so glad I finally get to jump in on this series talking about the preacher on the mount. Uh, today's text, Matthew 5, 17 to 20, it sets up the rest of his sermon. And I think it sets up the way we're meant to understand and uh, interpret the rest of the Gospel of Matthew. And, and even, in, in my opinion, it's, it's the text where it's like the most important text for how to read the entire Bible, how to read all of Scripture and how to interpret it all. Uh, I would even argue, maybe in another day, that this text sets up why Jesus, the preacher, gets crucified. If you've just started, you know, a Bible reading plan, and if you started the one that Ryan was on, uh, you read Genesis 38 this last Friday, and it's a story where Tamar tricks her father-in-law Judah to sleep with her and get an heir, and if you're really confused as to why that's in the Bible... Um, <laughs> or if you just want to learn, uh, lean a little bit closer, dig a little bit deeper into the word, you know, how we're supposed to understand this, this Bible. Um, today's text is for you. So we're going to look today at uh, Matthew 17 to 20, how it fits in Jesus's Sermon on the Mount as a whole. And then we're going to spend some time seeing how each of those sentences gets explained in the rest of the Gospel of Matthew. And then we're going to land on what, what this means for the followers of Jesus Christ. So... Would you please stand with me, if you're willing and able, in the reading of the gospel. I'm going to have the NAT up there. Um, Feel free to follow along. Do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I, Jesus, have not come to abolish these things, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke of a letter will pass from the law until everything takes place. So anyone who breaks one of the least of these commands and teaches others to do so will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever obeys them and teaches others to do so will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness goes way, way, way beyond that of the experts in the law and the Pharisees, you will never, ever, ever, ever enter into the kingdom of heaven. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. So I'm just going to dive right in today. Verse 17, it says, Do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. These two words, law and prophets, together, uh, it's it's kind of a shorthand way to refer to the whole Old Testament or Hebrew scripture. Um, If you've taken a class with Jessica in the Old Testament, you know there's like the... um, there's, there's like an acronym for Torah and Ketuvim and, and Navim, and there's, it's all Tanakh is, is a thing. But basically, law and prophets. Whenever you see law and prophets together, it means Old Testament scripture or the Hebrew scripture. Now, it's interesting here because uh, Jesus doesn't say law and the prophets. He says law or the prophets, which might suggest one key right, right at the very beginning, how to interpret uh, the Bible. See, the books in the Bible, they, they kind of speak to each other, or they speak about each other. Uh, There's a dialogue going on in the Old Testament scriptures. And so when you look at, you know, the first five books in the Bible, which is the law, uh, the first five books, you know, Genesis to Deuteronomy, those are, you know, you you get a whole bunch of commands, you get a whole bunch of story going on. And then you have all these prophets, you know, starting from Samuel all the way to Malachi. and, And the prophets will interpret the law. And so they'll speak about each other. And so an example of this is when Jesus is talking to the Pharisees about tithing. Uh, You'll find this in chapter 23, verse 23. He says, woe to you experts in the law, you Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your mint and dill and cumin, and yet you neglect what is more important in the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. So if you go to the law books, the first five books of the Bible, and you go to Leviticus, you know, it talks a lot about giving um, a tenth of what you have. And so these experts in the law, you know, these people who memorized probably the law books, they're like, okay, so that means even the little herbs that I got, you know, the mint and the dill, I'm going to give a tenth of that as well. In the same book, though, you have other things talking about, you know, I am the Lord your God, you know, be merciful, be just, and this kind of stuff. And, and also, you go to, so you go to the prophets, and it's in Micah uh, chapter 6, verse 7. Micah, so one of the prophets, he's reading the law, and he's interpreting the law this way. Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, which are animals that you would sacrifice, with 10,000 rivers of olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, you know, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. And so 
within the Old Testament scriptures, you have these voices sort of in dialogue with one another, sometimes even in competition with one another, saying one thing is more important than the other thing. And we, we, we kind of do this all the time as Christians. If you've read the Bible, you know, every Christian has their favorite go-to text, uh, text that they love and, and kind of put above every other text. You know, if I had one, it would be, you know, there's neither male nor female, slave nor free, Gentile or Jew in Christ, for all are one in Christ. That's my personal favorite. Um, but the term, you know, law and prophets, when you look at it in Hebrew scripture, or it's referring to Hebrew scripture here, and one of the other keys of biblical interpretation is you kind of try to see where else it is. So if you go to the whole Gospel of Matthew and you look for law and prophets and you go through the entire Gospel, you can see what Jesus is meaning by that. And so um, what you'll find is you'll find it here in 517, and you'll find it also in Matthew 712, where uh, the preacher says, In everything, treat others as you would want them to treat you, for this fulfills the law and the prophets. Now, this sort of frames the main body of the Sermon on the Mount, and I don't think we've done a full overview of the entire Sermon on the Mount yet, so I'm going to give you some structure. I got a nice little triangle slide here that's coming up. Um, So I got this slide from Jonathan Pennington. He wrote a sermon, uh, a theological commentary. Anyways, uh, GR stands for greater righteousness. But okay, so here's how it starts, or here's how the sermon is structured. You have the introduction, which is the Beatitudes. Um, We spent the last seven weeks here, you know, and and the introduction is basically all about who is Jesus speaking to? Who is is his audience? Um, His audience are the people who are of the kingdom. You know, it starts with, blessed are the poor in spirit, yours is the kingdom of heaven. So he is, uh, the the introduction for the sermon is basically, who is the audience that Jesus is talking to? Um, And then you get into the main body of the sermon. The main body of the sermon starts right here in 517. and And he's talking about what are the people of the kingdom of heaven? You know, who are they supposed to be like? What are they supposed to do? What, what uh, What is their actions? Uh, Because the first part is all about identity. You know, blessed are the poor. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst. Those aren't really actions. Those are more of like characteristics. Now we're talking about what are we supposed to do if we are going to call ourselves people of the kingdom of heaven. And so Jesus' kind of thesis statement, if you will, for the whole Sermon on the Mount is this right here. People of the kingdom of heaven are people who are fulfilling the law and the prophets. And so Matthew, you know, he's, he's this genius literary author. He, he kind of shows us how we are called to fulfill the law and the prophets. And so he uses these key phrases like law and prophets. So it's here, 517, and then it's here in 712. Um, and so if you go back to that slide with the triangle, you can put like 517 at the greater. If you go back to the slide, you can go to back to the slide with the with the triangle. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so you can put 517 at GR and Torah, or, you know, the, that's like sort of the body of the text. Beatitudes is the beginning. Two ways is sort of the conclusion. You can put 517 right there at GR and Torah, and then uh, 712 at the end of GR and outer relations, or greater righteousness, again, is what it is. And so that's the body of the text. Um, at the center of the Sermon on the Mount, you'll see the Lord's Prayer, which we prayed earlier. You can almost say that the entire Sermon on the Mount is a way to explain the Lord's Prayer, and the Lord's Prayer is a way to uh, enact the, the Sermon on the Mount. And, and so there's a nice little interplay um, with the Lord's Prayer. We're going to explore that again at the retreat. I'm so excited for that. Um, now, the reason I'm giving you all this structure and this context is if we're talking about biblical interpretation, um, how to read and interpret the Bible, one of the major errors that most people make with uh, reading the Bible is taking one verse or one little thing out of context. And so um, I could list a whole ton of really weird Bible verses if you just take it out of context. It's super weird. Uh, but Genesis 38 is super weird enough. <laughs> if, you're, if you're in there, you can go there. But anyways, Matthew expands on 5.17 to 20 uh, all throughout the rest of the gospel. And so he uses these structures and these techniques as well um, that a first century Jewish person would know about and would probably appreciate and be like, oh, this guy's such a good writer. I think he's such a cool writer. Um, But anyways, on the topic of techniques, one thing to note is there's this key literary technique that pretty much all the biblical authors love to use. It's this technique called chiasm. Do you know what a chiasm is? It's this idea that... um, if you, if you kind of go like this way, everything kind of mirrors each other. So if you were to go like 
A, B, C, D, it goes C, B, A, and the A's kind of line up together, and the B's line up together, and the C's line up together. Um, D would be like kind of the main point. And so Matthew structures his whole gospel chiastically. Uh, so the sermon works chiastically. The whole structure of the gospel is, works chiastically. And so if you read the whole uh, gospel of Matthew, you'll find out that there are five kind of main discourses that Jesus, is, uh, that Jesus teaches. And so the Sermon on the Mount is the first of the five. And then you go all the way, you know, chapter 10, chapter 13, chapter 18, and then chapter 23. Um, If you look at the Sermon on the Mount, then you go to chapter 23. Uh, So five chapters in and then five chapters from the end. It functions quite nicely. They're actually very, very similar to each other. You can kind of almost map it right on top of each other and see um, how they play with each other and how they uh, explain each other. So um, also, again, I'm going to keep gushing on Matthew. Uh, Why five discourses? Well, you know that the first five books of the, of the Bible, the Pentateuch, is you know, Genesis all the way to Deuteronomy. Those are the five kind of discourses or books of Moses. And so also, if you read Genesis to Deuteronomy, those also function sort of chiastically. Anyways, so he is, the reason why Matthew puts five main teachings in his gospel is to set it up, and maybe in a not-so-subtle way to the Jewish audience, to say that Jesus is the greater Moses. Um, Now, that is a really bold statement to a Jewish audience uh, who looked to Moses as the greatest prophet. There was no one greater than Moses. Um, And so this could be a reason why the religious leaders kind of took offense to him, took took such an issue with him. Another really fun word to nerd out on in this passage, uh, 517, is the word fulfill. Uh, Matthew uses this fulfilling language seven times uh, right before the Sermon on the Mount. So again, seven is this kind of symbolic number in Hebrew numerology uh, for completion or fulfillment. Again, Matthew, such such an artist, he's he's cool. Um, But I love the way Bible Project, the Bible Project, fantastic uh, teaching resource online. I love the way that they interpret this word fulfill. Rather than fulfill, they switch it around and they say fill full. Fill full. Uh, that is, I think, a fantastic way to look at how at what Jesus is doing in the rest of the sermon. So, like, imagine a glass cup. You know, he is not like Jesus is not here to abolish the glass cup, but he's here to fill it to the brim with water. He's saying that you know the law and the prophets, the whole Old Testament scripture, is this kind of foundation. It's this vessel. And he's saying, let me fill it to the top. Let me complete it. You know, uh, an empty glass that has never been filled with water, ice cold water, hasn't filled its purpose yet. You know, like that glass cup hasn't uh, found its meaning until it's been filled with water and and someone is drinking it. And so, um, yeah, that's that's one way you can think of fill full. He's here to fill it to its fullest. Now, um, I'm going to take one small tangent here as well. If you're wondering how I kind of nerd out on these things, uh, without a commentary, you can go to netbible.org, netbible.org. You can click on any text, any word on a text. You can go into the Greek. You can do something called a strong search and see where it is everywhere else in the Bible. It's a really fun way to read and understand what is going on in the text. Um, you can see all the other English words as well that can be used to translate the Greek word. Uh, the Net Bible itself also offers um, some reasoning as to why they choose some words over other words or why they omit other words. If you want to be a Bible nerd, I mean, for me, it's the fun stuff of sermon prep. But yeah, anyways, okay, so back to the context. So these three verses, 517 to 20, they're the introduction to, again, the body of the entire sermon, and it also sort of sets up the first third of the sermon. So uh, preachers love to kind of do three-point sermons, or at least like, like classic back in the day. We're all told to do three-point sermons. Um, I, I know Shell hated three-point sermons. I, I don't like them that much. But Jesus does sort of a three-part sermon. So there is some biblical uh, reasoning for that. Anyways, so the first part of the Sermon on the Mount kind of goes from chapter 5, 17, all the way to the end of chapter 5. If you look at the end of chapter 5, verse 48, It says in pretty much every translation, so then be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Um, So so if you read 517 to 20 and you read this thesis statement, you know, you got to exceed 
the righteousness of the Pharisees and all this kind of stuff. It, it lands right here. Be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. You know, that's sort of what everything here is kind of pointing towards. And there's all these kind of commands in between these two statements. And you look at this and you're like, wait, nobody is perfect, right? Like, who, who can actually be perfect? Uh, so Jesus says he's here to, again, fill full rather than abolish scripture. The people of the kingdom of heaven, they're meant to obey and teach these commandments or this way of life in scripture and do it to the fullest sense, to not neglect even the smallest thing. And they've got to exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees to even enter into the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom people have to be perfect. Uh, He says even more like the righteousness, like to be, he says, be more righteousness, uh, be more righteous than the Pharisees and experts in the law. And not just like a little bit more righteous, but they, like in the Greek, they use this word play on. Like you got to greatly, abundantly exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees who are like, you know, the most holiest people at that time. Or you will, again, there's this double negative, like you will never, ever, ever, ever enter into the kingdom of heaven unless you greatly, greatly exceed the righteousness of the righteous, most righteous people that people thought were the most righteous people on the earth at that point. <laughs> um, so, you know, 50 years ago, people might point to, like, pastor or something. Today, nowadays, you know, the most righteous people that you might think are teachers and nurses and doctors and stuff. There's a survey done. So, you know, think of the people in this room who are teachers and, and nurses. You know, you got to exceed their righteousness by a great amount. Otherwise, you will never, ever, ever enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, does that sound daunting, if not impossible, to you guys? I would say probably. Um, but let's dig, let's dig a little bit deeper. The word translated as perfect here, which, again, 30 translations render this word perfect as perfect. Uh, It's, in my opinion, a really bad translation of the Greek word teleos. Um, Teleos. So it's like this, uh, like, what does perfection even mean in the English for us today? We we think of, uh, we think of, like, what, never making any mistakes or uh, trying harder and harder and harder to always be perfectly moral, to, you know, always compost and get rid of all plastics and buy cruelty-free meat, you know. Like, is there is there a better word for the word teleos? Um, well, the w- root word of this word perfect or teleos is telos. Telos means end or completion or goal or like reaching maturity or fulfillment. Again, another word for fulfillment. I think the Hebrew word that Matthew had in mind was the word shalom. Shalom you've heard as like sort of peace, but it's more than just peace. I think many weeks ago we talked about how shalom has this idea of completeness or wholeness. Uh, there is a way to be human that is fully human. There's a way to be, uh, to be whole. It, like perfection means, in this case, to be fully human. Being teleos means being, living as a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, modeled after the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, Jesus. We're called to, be, to live in a way that fulfills what is foreshadowed in the law and the prophets. You know, to be exceedingly more righteous than the Pharisees and the experts in the law is to live like Jesus. To obey the commands and to teach others to do the same is to live like Jesus who fulfilled the commandments. Matthew twenty-two thirty-six 36 says, Jesus is, at, you know, he's asked by this rich young ruler, teacher, which commandment is in the law is the greatest? Jesus says to him, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. That's Deuteronomy 6, 5. And then this is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like this, love your neighbor as yourself. That's Leviticus nineteen eighteen. All the law and the prophets depend on these two commandments. Love your neighbor as yourself. You know, treat others as you would want them to treat you. Love, love is this ultimate commandment. And it is the way that we're called to interpret all the rest of Scripture. If all you took away from today is, is that you know, the whole Scripture is about Jesus, and Jesus is all about love, and being his people means loving God and loving others, you know, that's, that's enough. That is the core of Christian ethics. Love is the greatest command. But love is not this abstract feeling. It's, it's, it's concrete. You know, it's always treated as an action in the Bible. It's obedience. It is relational. It's, it looks like willing to die on a wooden torture execution device to, uh, you know, to save the ones you love. The apostle John says, God is love. 
And God is, you know, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Love, love can't exist in a vacuum, right? You, like a single year person can't be love. It, love has to exist with others. And yeah, so, so it's always relational. Love is relational. And God in flesh is Jesus. Love in flesh is Jesus. Jesus is how we define love and his way of loving You know, his humble, meek, sacrificial, patient, compassionate, his kind love is is where we can fill our lives to the fullest. Jesus is the one who completes the righteousness. He's the one who exceeds it greatly. He's the one who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. He is the blessed one of the Beatitudes. He is the Lord and King and Messiah and Savior. So how we read scripture, how we interpret its commands, we have to do it through the lens of Jesus being the perfect model and and the perfect model of love and human life that has a full fullness to it. So um, I'm going to preach chiastically today. So if you're taking notes, that's the center. Uh, (laughs) Beginning the the descent of the plane towards landing. If Jesus is the one who exceeds the righteousness of the godless people of his day and age, you know, how are we going to follow suit as his disciples. Now, the focus of the Pharisees and the experts was on the letter of the law, Um, but not the heart of the law. So, like I mentioned earlier, if Matthew does things chiastically, right? So if you go five chapters from the end of the book, chapter 23, you can see all the ways where Jesus says their righteousness falls short. You've heard the one about the dill and the mint. I'm just going to pull out a few of the verses here. Jesus says to his disciples, you know, the experts in the law... The Pharisees, they sit on Moses' seat. Therefore, pay attention to what they tell you to do and do it, but do not do what they do, for they don't practice what they teach. They tie up heavy loads, hard to carry, and they put them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to even lift a finger to move them. They do all of their deeds to be seen by people, for they make their flactories wide and their tassels long. They love the place of honor at banquets. They love the best seats at the synagogues. They elaborate greetings and the marketplaces they love having people call themselves rabbi but for you the greatest among you will be your servant whoever humbles himself will be exalted but woe to you experts in the law you pharisees you hypocrites you know and there's these seven woes you know you lock people out of the kingdom of heaven you turn people into children of hell woe to you for being greedy for being self-indulgent for being beautiful on the outside but having a heart filled with death See, these Pharisees and the experts in the law, they knew what was written. They probably memorized whole chunks of scripture. And they followed it to the best that they could. They calculated their herbs into their giving. But they missed the heart, the core. You know, they thought they knew what it meant to be holy. Um, And so when Jesus says, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect, it's sort of this play on this very well-known Leviticus passage, be holy as I, your God, am holy. Jesus rephrases it because these people all had an idea of what it meant to be holy. And so he switches this word to be whole. Be whole as God is whole. Be full as God is whole. Be relational. Be loving. See, holiness in, in a lot of ways of defining holiness is about setting yourself apart from everything else that is unholy. But that is the empty cup. Setting yourself apart is just the vessel. What you're trying to do is to be holy is to be full of love. Um, see, these experts, and the, they didn't practice these commandments out of love, but out of pride. They wanted to be great, and they wanted to be exalted. But don't we all also want to be great and exalted? They were doing their best to be great with all the tools that they had. You know, they used scripture and culture and money. Everything they had, they tried to use to be great. But what Jesus is saying is that these actions alone aren't enough. The heart has to be transformed along with the actions. Ezekiel eleven nineteen says, I will give them one heart, a new spirit I will put within them. I will remove the heart of stone from their flesh and give them a heart of flesh. Now the prophet Jeremiah thirty one thirty three says, I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God. They shall be my people. They shall be the people of the kingdom of heaven. See, the prophets, they were looking forward to a day when people wouldn't just follow these commands, but to know the heart of them and to have the heart within them. 
to have it, you know, to not be motivated extrinsically, but intrinsically. The prophets were looking forward to just a new way of life. Some people approach the Bible with this idea that it's this magical book, you know. Somehow if you do what it says, you're just going to prosper in life. It's this book of wisdom, and there's tons of wisdom. Follow it, and you'll have this happy, you know, marriage and plenty of children and lots of finances. Or, or some people read it as, like, just really good literature, which it is, which it is. Um, or, and, and others might look at it as, like, a history book or, or even, like, a science textbook for some people. Um, but when Jesus says he came to fulfill scripture, he doesn't look at scripture just as like this history or science or myth or wisdom. He sees it as something called messianic literature. You know, it's, it's about a savior who is to come, who will rescue all of creation from darkness and from chaos. It was all of the scripture is about this one who will come to give us new hearts to show that ultimately obeying and following the commands are not the main point of it, yes, we should do it. We have to teach and do even the smallest of them. But that itself is impossible without a new heart, a resurrected, renewed heart. Entering the kingdom of heaven and being a true citizen or heir of the kingdom without God's help is impossible. And, and this impossibility is mentioned in Matthew nineteen sixteen. You know, again, this rich young ruler says, what must I do to gain eternal life? And he says, keep the commandments. And if you wish to be perfect, again, this word perfect or whole, go sell your possessions, give your money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. And so this rich man who comes to Jesus walks away. Jesus then says to his disciples, I tell you the truth, it'll be harder for a rich person to enter like, it will be hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter into the kingdom of heaven. The disciples, you know, they said, who can be saved? Like, it's impossible to be saved then. And Jesus looks at them and says, yeah, this is impossible. It's impossible for humans. But for God, all things are possible. See, this Bible is all about Jesus. Following him and being in relationship with God you know, that is how, he, he is the one who exchanges the dead heart within us, these death-producing hearts, to something pure and genuine, and something that's 100% human. It is through Jesus that this happens. You know, Matthew 10, 24 says, A disciple is not greater than his teacher, nor a slave greater than his master. It's enough for the uh, disciple to become like the teacher. He is telling us we are meant to be like him um, and teach him to do the same. And so you go to Matthew 7, 7 to 11, it says, ask and it will be given to you. For everyone who asks or sees, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So this is where we get to the center of the sermon where uh, Jesus has the Lord's Prayer. You know, he teaches us how to pray. And he says, you know, we, we're told to go to the Father and ask, hey, your kingdom come, your will be done. His will is to renew our hearts and to, uh, to, for God's name to be hallowed, to be holy, to be revered through our entire lives on earth as it is in heaven. You know, he's calling us to fulfill what he started, you know, loving the universe into wholeness. So to summarize, Jesus is saying this whole scripture is about him. It's one of the key ways to read the Bible. It's all about Jesus. He's the one who completes it and fills it to the fullest. The people of the kingdom are people who are of scripture, people who obey and live out all of this kingdom living fully to the fullest, uh, people who know scripture and see its completion in Jesus. Yet this level that we're called to, this level of righteousness that we're called to and be a citizen, it's impossible without God, yet it is possible. As we, all we need, you know, this perfection, this wholeness comes from being humble talks about uh, being like a child, being like a child willing to just ask, boldly ask a dad for anything. Um, and in this case, to, to do the impossible, to change our hearts. You know, if you stick around long enough in church, that's probably one thing I can guarantee is that you're going to see and you're going to hear others talk about how God does actually change hearts, change our lives, change our loves, our desires, and, and our motives. And all this can happen as we pray. So we're going to close with a time of communion.